Do you think you can get back with an ex and make it work? Only if you change the entire relationship. Hi, I'm Yui Xu. And I'm Julie Kraftchik. We're active daters turned dating sociologists. Here to dive into everything modern dating and relationships. Welcome to the Dateable Podcast. Before we get into this episode, a quick word from our sponsors that make it possible. Is anyone else struggling with what to wear these days? I feel like styles change faster than dating trends, and I certainly don't want to be buying new clothes all the time just to keep up. So enter Armoire. Armoire allows you to rent high-quality designer clothing for every occasion. And when I signed up, I took a style quiz, and based on my preferences, they offer suggestions that would best match my lifestyle. The more I rent, the more on point the suggestions get. I recently rented this gorgeous Tanya Taylor silk dress for date night and got so many compliments. I wouldn't normally have chosen this style, but with Armoire, you can take chances because if you don't like it, you just swap it out. Right now, our listeners can give Armoire a try and get up to 50% off their first month. That's up to $125 off. Just visit armoire.style slash dateable. That is armoire.style spelled A-R-M-O-I-R-E dot style slash D-A-T-E-A-B-L-E to get up to 50% off your first month and never worry about what to wear again. Again, try Armoire today. And if you forget the link, just head to our Instagram and find it under special offers. Did you know we're eating and drinking roughly a credit card's worth of plastic a week? Yep, that's right. Blue Land set out to do something about it. Eliminate the need for single-use plastic in the cleaning products we reach for the most. I'm absolutely obsessed with Blue Land for a couple of reasons. One, how they're helping the environment. Two, how convenient they make my life. And three, how freaking beautiful their pastel containers are. All you have to do is fill your reusable bottles with water, drop in the tablets, and wait for them to dissolve. You'll never have to grab bulky clean any products on your groceries run again. My partner was a little skeptical the other day if the dishwasher tablets would work as well as the pods we usually use. But after the dishes came out sparkling clean, he was sold as well. It's not only super convenient, but Blue Land is also affordable. Refill start is just $2.25 and you can even set up a subscription or buy in bulk for additional savings. Blue Land has a special offer for listeners. Right now, get 15% off your first order by going to blueland.com slash datable. You won't want to this blueland.com slash datable for 15% off. That's blueland.com slash datable to get 15% off. Hello, friends. Welcome back to Datable. We have this guest on for this episode whom we've been trying to get for a very long time. I would say maybe years. Am I exaggerating? Eight seasons now. (laughs) We've been following him for a while, for sure. And many of you have probably been following him for a long time. His name is Mark Groves. Woo! And uh, (laughs) he is on our episode, and we got to talk to him. Like, we actually got to talk to the Mark Groves. And if you are not familiar with him, he's a man. It's hard to describe who Mark Groves is. He is... He is everything. He does everything. <laughs> he is. He does it all. He's a speaker, writer, motivator, creator, collaborator, author, like everything. And yeah. he talks about relationships and how to how to build relationships that are right for you. Yeah. And I think especially we hit him at a great time because this is a highly relatable topic for many of you. He just wrote a book with his now wife, but it's all about how they broke up the first time around and got back together mm-hmm. and basically rebuilt a relationship. So we've gotten so many questions before of like, should I get back together with my ex? Is it possible to get back together with my ex? What do I need to do for it to happen? So I think this is a really great look into second shots with the same people and how do you actually make it work because I've been that person that's given it many tries again with an ex Mm. and it didn't work again so it's good to hear a story from someone where they were able to make things work And what you'll take away from this conversation are things like when do you end it with someone like when do you call it quits and then when do you decide to get back together And how do you decide to get back together? How do you redesign your relationship again? And how do you both own your shit in the process? I think that. yeah. (laughs) Because sometimes it's easy to be like, well, they did this wrong and I am the good one here. So whatever happened, how do you both come into the relationship fresh? So we're going to hear from Mark about his experience. But I guess from your perspective, UA, do you think it's possible to get back with an ex and make it work? 
I used to think, hell no, uh, <laughs> because there's a really good reason why you broke up in the first place. But now I'm starting to come around to the fact that, you know, some relationships just need some time apart. Yeah. They really do. Because you go through the motions of being with someone and then you just assume they're always going to be there. And so therefore you don't work on some of your own shit that yeah. we were just talking about. You're not confronting yourself because you have this leverage of this other person with you. So I do think some relationships, the right type of relationships do need some of time apart. There is coming back together, but it's like it takes a lot of work to come back together the right way. Yeah, I would say arguably maybe more work than even starting a brand new relationship. For sure. You know, there's some things that maybe are a little more developed because you know the person to some degree, but it's almost like you need to relearn the person and ignore some of that too. Yeah. It, you know, you'll take away from this conversation is both of you need to make some changes yeah. during that time apart in order to get back together. You can't just be the two of the same people getting back together. It'll feel comfortable at first because yeah. you'll know each other very well, but you're just going to get back into the same patterns over and over again. I mean, people that have been following this podcast have probably heard me talk about it, but I was in this cycle for five years. It wasn't like mm -hmm. full five years on again, off again, but it was the cycle of like, I can't do the serious relationship, but I love you and I want to do it. Yeah. And then would come back around and be like, I think I can do it. I'm ready. And then nothing would change. And it would be great yep. for like a month. It would be amazing. And then the same issues would come back. So yes. I kind of came into this. I don't know. It's like this right person, wrong time. It's a really hard balance because like I think for years when I was in the thick of this, I that's what I thought. I was like right person, mm. wrong time. We'll get back together when like he figures out his shit, gets his own stuff in order. I never took accountability on my side. It was always what he needed to fix. Mm -hmm. And I thought for a long time that that was possible. And then I swung to the other side after I realized that that wasn't possible in my scenario of being like, nope, you're just wasting your time waiting for this person to change and yeah. wrong time, wrong person. That was kind of my new stance. And now I'm kind of coming back after this conversation with Mark of like, I do think it's possible, but yes, two people need to be very committed to doing the work and treat it like a new relationship. Yeah, it's the, you have to have intentionality, sure. But the action has to follow the intentionality. Two people will not work if they just verbally say, I love you, let's no. make it work, yet not follow through with that intention. Like it's very easy to have the intention of wanting to be with someone. Oh, it's totally. a lot harder to follow that with action, right? As we've all learned in relationships, this is why so many couples get back together all the time. You know, they break yeah. up, get back together, get back together. Because it's it's the intentionality that gravi you're get gravitating towards. You want to hear those words. Oh, I really want to be with you. I really want to make it work this time around. But what are you actively doing to make it work? That is the key. And most people do not hold the key to a successful relationship because of that. There was a stat that I really held on to when I was in this of that 50% of couples break up at least once and then get mm. back together, which I found really interesting. And that I think was good and bad because it kind of gave that sense of false hope. And for me, the kryptonite words were when my ex would be like, I miss you. Like, yeah. let's start talking. But there, like you were saying, there was never a plan of how things are going to be different. It was, I miss you. I still love you. Like all the feel good things. But it was lacking, you know, and we talk about this with Mark in depth. When they decided to give it another chance, there was a time where his ex came to him first and he was like, no, not enough has changed mm -hmm. and put that away. And then when it came back again, they had a very tight relationship container where they yes. were doing things differently and, you know, actually trying to build a new relationship. So I think it's so easy to just slip back in and pick up where you left off. And that's what I think a lot of couples are trying to get back together do. And I don't know the stats of once you break up and you get back together again, <laughs> how many of those actually make it for the log haul? That stat, I don't know. But it makes so much fucking sense. Think about it. You get into a relationship with a mere stranger, right? And then you try to make it work. You try to see how would this relationship operate? And then maybe you take some time apart to think about what would life be like 
really without this person. Yeah. And the only way to imagine that is to not have them in your life. And then two is to think about if we were to get back together, what is that relationship we can design now, knowing now that we've have this familiarity with each other. It makes sense. You like, I almost feel like maybe relationships need an intentional pause after a certain amount of time and then get back together with an intentional plan. So I actually don't think you need to break up in order to do this. Mm. And, you know, we talked about in this episode there, they call it relationship 1.0 was the first iteration. And then relationship 2.0 is their current relationship. I actually did this exercise with my partner last night where we took inventory of like what is going well in our relationship, what are some points of contention, and basically made a new container of like basically everything good stays, but this stuff in addition is in like the next iteration of our relationship. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important because a lot of this stuff we didn't know when we got together. Like part of it's yeah, like, you don't. yeah, like your needs are different at the beginning. Like at the beginning, I'm just like, you know, I want someone that shows up consistently and, you know, will call me their girlfriend. But like the needs change as the relationship evolves. Yeah. And also, I think the other piece is you don't live with the person. You aren't it with them day to day. You're out of the honeymoon period. So things fester. Things come up. Things change. Mm -hmm. So I think having conscious check-ins can happen even if you don't take like a break and pause from each other. It's, a, it's still a pause of what is happening in our relationship relationship, but not like a pause, let's break up and go our separate ways and only use that to figure out that we're meant to be together. Right. You can't be in a relationship and expect that to be the same relationship forever. And so how do you get ahead of that and infuse this intentionality of like, what is our next phase? Yeah. Like, how do we want to design this next phase? What do we want to take into it? And what do we want to discard from our yeah. first phase? It's like a shedding process, right? Yeah. Like, you're you're becoming a butterfly in this relationship process. And that is something we we miss all the time because we just get into relationships and yeah. without thinking about like, how do we want to operate? What does this even look like? And how do we want to ride out the waves of change? I mean, the reality is my partner and I will probably do a 3.0 and a 4.0. Sure. I think especially if you have kids, I've talked to a lot of my friends in relationships that have children and things change drastically then. So yeah. to think that you're just going to follow the same norms and ways of being when you first met years ago at this point, potentially, and you're in that like, oh, let's grab drinks and make each other laugh. It's very different than the relationship of co-parenting. Yeah. And for you know, those of you listening, like Julie's example is a little bit different than Mark and Kylie because Julie and her partner are actively trying to figure out the next phase of the relationship. In Mark's example, and many of you have been here, they were on different pages of how much effort they were willing to, to spend on the, this relationship. So he was the one pushing for the relationship to get to mm. the next phase and his wife was not. So that's why they took their intentional pause. So you'll probably find some sort of like something that resonates with you in both it, it, these stories. But ultimately it's like, you got to figure out what works for you. And sometimes it could be taking that break. And sometimes it could just be being intentional about saying, what is next? What does the next phase look like? Yeah, it's something you and I talked about after we recorded with Mark too. I think for me, I feel like I've been in relationships where the person just like outwardly is like, I don't want to try. And yeah. <laughs> Those ones yeah. just didn't work out. Like my yeah, ex. That's there easy. Was, there would hit a point with him every time that he's like, I just can't do this. But yeah. then this part that I had trouble maybe understanding was this situation where someone is in it with you, but mm -hmm. you still feel like they're not. And mm -hmm. it was interesting because you, a like you, as soon as Mark talked about this, because Mark and Kylie before in their relationship 1.0 had been together for five years, lived together. Yes. From the outside, it looked like everything was like rolling along. And that yes. like was similar, I think, to your relationship. But like you, as soon as he said it, you were just like, yeah, I feel it. Yeah. You can feel when someone says one thing, but their energy is elsewhere. And I was giving Julie this example of like during our check-ins with my ex, there would be nothing brought. I would be like, okay, how do you think things are going? He'd be like, great, things are fine. And I could see in his eyes that he's elsewhere. I don't know where. <laughs> 
But I would ask him, I would actually ask him, where are you right now? I know you're physically here, but like, where are you mentally? And he's like, I'm fine. Like, things are great. Let's keep going. Let's keep going with couples therapy. Let's do- keep doing that. And even in couples therapy or towards the end with our last few sessions, he would he would just treat it like like an all hands meeting, like <laughs> Things are, yep, yep. We uh, made plans for me to move to LA this week and we're packing things up and we are on time with everything. We are tracking well, you know, like <laughs> just stuff like that. And then you're like, okay, is anything holding you back? Any fears? Any Anything you want to talk about? Nope, nope. All good. All good. So you're like, where are you? But you didn't feel that. You didn't feel like it was all good, even though he was saying it. I just feel like the point of a check-in and re- and therapy is to avoid the all good, mm. right? And all good is a cop-out answer. If someone truly wanted to know how your day was going, you wouldn't say all good. you probably give them some specifics. Yeah. So he never, like, towards the end, he wasn't willing to give specifics of what was going on in his mind. So I felt him turning away from me. Mm. But verbally, he was still like, yes, let's keep going. Let's keep doing this thing. It's a very interesting place to be in. For sure. Yeah. But yeah. We're going to get into all of it. So I'm glad, though, that you were able to add that perspective. So you would not get back together with that ex is what I'm hearing. <laughs> oh, hell no. Oh, hell no. For many unless reasons. He, <laughs> unless, he, yeah, unless he came back as a completely different person, in which case he would not be him. So, <laughs> But yeah, this is a, a great conversation. And we can't wait to have Kylie on our show next season. So just know there's a follow up to this episode. (laughs) Awesome. Well, other great news that we have, we are actually really excited of how well the Meeting People IRL Masterclass did. As you all know, we piloted this last week and the registration closed all of that. And you and I have been getting a lot of responses for people being like, oh, I missed it. I still want to do it. Like, is it too late? We're like, why not keep it open? Like in the past, (laughs) like other ones, you know, there's been some bandwidth reasons. But for this, we're like, yeah, like, why not? So we're actually going to be keeping it going all summer. So if you didn't get a spot, you can always go to datablepodcast.com slash programs and sign up anytime this summer. And the feedback we've been getting from people who went through the masterclass, because I would say like most of them are finished the master class, the ones that that did the program, their feedback has been, this isn't like a class where you sit and like learn. This is like a like a quick start or jump start guide to getting out there and meeting people. Like so so many of them felt inspired right away after this hour. Yeah. And just actually doing like implementing some of the actions the same day. So that's really exciting to know that don't worry, this is not like a multi course series, you know, like you have to devote all this no time to it. No one wants to, to do that. Yeah. The whole goal <laughs> of the masterclass is to get you out there like that and just start meeting people. So we will be toying with the names. If you have any suggestions, feel free to DM (laughs) us. But it'll be the same thing. It just might not be called a masterclass. But for now, it is. And also another thing that we got a few of that we heard of was that people were gifting them, like coupled friends were gifting them to their single friends. So we love that. It's totally possible. You literally just register your friend's email instead of yours if you want to do it. So love it. Yes. Pay it forward. Gift that to someone. IRL summer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, you, especially if you think someone you know right now, someone you really care about is going through this exact challenge of like, how do I meet people out in the wild? Well, you have the answer at your yeah. fingertips. We did do a poll on Instagram and it was like 95% of people wanted to meet IRL. Some of them obviously were open yeah. to IRL and apps, but I think it's not an either or. It's like, not. Why not? not? And especially in not. summer when it's like nice out and yeah. there's a lot of people are just like more chill and laid back. You might as well. And it's kind of sparked a few other ideas for you and I too with this whole IRL summer. So stay tuned. Yes. So how do you sign up? Since we are keeping it open, just go to datablepodcast.com slash programs and you'll find all of the info there. Cool. Okay. At Datable Podcast on Instagram, Datable Podcast on YouTube or Datable, Datable on YouTube. We are just Datable there. And we are starting to air our long form brunch talk episodes with video Mm -hmm. on YouTube. So if you would like to eat brunch with us, 
then <laughs> feel free to put us on your TV. That's not creepy at all, but we'll yeah. go with it. No, we'll watch you eat. <laughs> Don't worry, we're not judging you. <laughs> no. Because we're not really Never. there. <laughs> no, because we can't see, but it's fine. <laughs> You can see us, but we can't see you. <laughs> that sounds super creepy. <laughs> super creepy. <laughs> Anyways, though, we are kind of, you know, doing the last few brunch talks of the season. But if you have a question, please get them in. Leave us a review. Or if you don't have a question, you just want to leave us a review. Help us yeah. get to the, the 1K mark. We can keep getting guests like Mark if we get to 1K such a barometer for people to be like, yep, this is a reputable podcast. Let's do it. So help us get even better guests that will in turn help you. We very, very much appreciate all of your ratings and reviews. Yeah. And we had someone reach out the other day just being like, hey, I want to leave you a review. And I really just don't understand where to do it on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. There's no shame of that. Feel free to DM us. We will help you out if that's a thing that is getting in the way. I swear they do it. They make it so confusing on purpose. Especially Spotify. It's like hidden under like dots now. It's just not intuitive. So no. There's no, nothing we'll wrong. Show you. We'll show you. Yes. <laughs> cool. Okay. Well, before we get into it with Mark, let's hear a message from our sponsor. Do you ever wish there was a way to warn people about your ex or alert others about a creepy date or find out if your significant other is seeing someone else or just curious to know what's happening in your local dating scene? I can't see you, but I feel you all nodding your heads. So you'll appreciate that Date Detective makes it all possible. Date Detective is a brand new app that just launched. They're on a mission to create a safer dating community through the power of information. The app lets you review your dates and share your experiences while maintaining your privacy. So how it works is that you post information you like to share about your date, including their name, phone number, and or social media accounts. Their personal details stay private, but your review about them is public. When someone else searches for that person's name, phone number, or social media username, they can see the reviews about them. Now, Date Detective also has community features like groups where you can connect with others or make your own private space with you and your friends. Investigate your next date on Date Detective. Download the app through date-detective.app. Summer is basically here, and your wardrobe needs an upgrade, right? Instead of a flimsy fast fashion haul, which I used to be guilty of, now spend your money wisely on high-quality essentials that will last beyond the season. Quince is my spot for quiet luxury without paying luxury prices. They offer a range of must-have items like 100% European linen under $50, 14-karat gold jewelry from $30, and my most favorite recent purchase was a pair of comfy, high-quality biker shorts that cost about half of what I would normally pay. I know you're wondering how they do it. Quinn's partners directly with top factories to cut out the cost of the middleman and pass the savings on to you. And they only work with factories that use safe, ethical, and responsible manufacturing practices and premium eco-friendly fabrics and finishes. So I can feel good about getting high quality items that last longer. Upgrade your closet this summer with Quince. Right now, go to quince.com slash datable to get free shipping and 365 day returns on your next order. That's quince.com slash slash D-A-T-E-A-B-L-E for free shipping and 365-day returns. Quince.com slash Datable. Spring is in the air, and you know what adds an extra spring to my step? Our partners at Via Hemp. Need to chill out after a long day? There's a Via Gummy for that. Dealing with anxiety or stress? There's a Gummy for that too. Want to set the mood in the bedroom? There's a Gummy for that called High Love. Via also carries a wide array of other gummies with and without THC, ranging from 0 to 100 milligrams. I've been struggling to stay focused lately, so I was excited to try out their Flow State gummies. These felt like a good bet to me too, because they were non-psychoactive and THC-free. But they definitely delivered, boost my daily energy and focus. So whether you're a two milligram or a 50 milligram user, you can shop through their website for any strength and effects. So head to Via Hemp and use the code DATABLE to receive 15% off and one free sample of their award-winning gummies, 21 plus. That's V-I-I-A 
hemp.com and use the code datable at checkout. Please support our show and tell them that we sent you. Take your passion and pleasure to a whole new level with high love from Via Hemp. Okay, let's hear it from Mark Groves. Second chances, reuniting with your ex, something I've definitely thought about at some points in my life with exes. But this couple, Mark and Kylie, were successful in reuniting and then establishing a strong relationship. And that's what we're going to talk about today. What does it mean to reunite with your ex and to basically redesign your love again? So we've got Mark Groves, who we've been following for so long, and we're so happy to finally get him on our show. Yes. The human connection (laughs) specialist, founder of Create the Love, host of the Mark Groves podcast, and co-author of Liberated Love with his wife, Kylie. How are you, Mark? So good. I'm so excited to be here. You know, whenever anyone talks about getting back together with your ex, I kind of sometimes forget that we did that, (laughs) you know, because it feels like quite a while ago, even though it wasn't. It was, what, 2020-ish? Yeah. And it probably just because when you get back together, it's a different relationship. Completely. Yeah. So we're going to give you just a brief introduction here. Who is Mark Groves? He's 45 years old, lives in, I love this, Kudalen, Idaho. <laughs> when I was reading this, I'm like, this is probably my favorite name for a place in Idaho. Sounds like, so classy. So French. Yeah. It's so Kudalen, <laughs> Idaho. Kudalen. <laughs> and he's lived between there and Vancouver for a few years as well. And you've decided to settle there permanently recently. You know, we have, but we haven't, you know, that we're like still in the journey for where is home. Okay. Well, because right now you're in Calgary. So it's neither of those places. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) I'm a vagabond right now. (laughs) And as we already described, Mark is married to Kylie and they have a beautiful baby boy. So let's start from your relationship with Kylie. You were together for five years. Then you broke up. Then you got back together. So take us back to relationship 1.0, as you like to call it. How did you both meet? And what was that love story in the beginning? You know, we met on the often undiscussed dating app Instagram. And, uh, <laughs> How very Gen Z of you. <laughs> yeah, right. Let's be honest. Everyone's dropping in the DMs, oh, yeah. which I dropped into her DM. Okay. And we had been following each other for a while, sent her a message, told her I'd love to connect beyond the gram. <laughs> And she wrote me back, no games. Like, I remember she wrote me back. At that time, you had to send a picture when you sent a message. Oh, wow. And I sent a picture of a sunset from uh, Grouse Mountain. She sent a picture back of a sunset somewhere in the desert. And she wrote me back. And I remember writing her back and saying, well, that's about the best possible reply I could have imagined. Because there was just like no game, Mm -hmm. which is how it should be, you know, that it's not forced, that there's not like some sort of strategy that has to go into it. Which I'm not negating that I think we need like the skill set when it comes to dating and relating. There is a skill set for it. So yeah, in relationship 1.0, she eventually moved to Vancouver. And in that relationship, there was always this sort of nudging feeling for me that Kylie wasn't fully in it. Mm. And we were traveling in New Zealand and Australia. And I remember I went for this run and I'm like thinking while I'm on the run, I'm just so tired of like... I'm not here to chase anybody. Mm -hmm. And I feel like every time I get close to her, she withdraws. And then I have to get close again, and then she withdraws. So I came back from the run, and I said that to her. And she said to me, yeah, you know, there's there's a dream I had that I've not told you about, but it's been really, really living in my psyche. I've been afraid of it. And it was that she was in a burning house, and she had to leave, like get out in the relationship. The burning house was our relationship. Oh, wow. So, you know, our relationship's good, you know, by every other metric other than the burning inferno <laughs> that is supposed to represent it in a dream. But the actual experience of the relationship on this sort of skill set, relational, you know, are we healthy? Are we not? Yeah. We would have checked healthy. Mm. But on a deeper level, there's this subtle fear of not staying for Kai. And there's this fear that I'm in a relationship with someone who's not turning towards me. Mm. Like her, mm. if you think about it sort of figuratively, her shoulders are turned sideways and I'm turned directly front facing. Yeah. And what's really interesting is that if I was truly in discernment, because I'm sure for a lot of people listening, or watching that we can relate to this feeling of just choose it. Like, just why don't you just turn towards like, Mm -hmm. it's not fair. You're the one who needs to do the work. You had the damn dream. I didn't have it. Right. Mm -hmm. So 
I recognized that I actually should have in that information turned to my shoulders mm. because that's discernment. Like you can't build a relationship with someone who's not building a relationship with you, who's like, still, I'm not sure. Yeah. People can be not sure. That's a normal human experience. But what do we do with the not sure? Well, I did what most people do, unfortunately. And we spent three more years <laughs> in that not sure E. Mm -hmm. And what we did was we started to pathologize it. You know, I had already been studying relationships and teaching them. And if you think about it in relationship, it's like, well, why do people who teach relationships, therapists, coaches, doctors, nurses, right? All these types of service related providing roles are people who are highly attuned and likely had a role in their family where they took care of people. Yeah. So what better job <laughs> in the world than to monetize your survival strategy? But here I am in a relationship. I'm like, well, you have some relational challenges. We're in a relationship. I've got value now. Yeah. You can't go anywhere. Yeah. And so we went to psychotherapists. We did coaching. We had mentors. We did all the things. Red attached, of course. And when she learned about avoidance, she was like, I'm so avoidant. <laughs> That's and, me. <laughs> yeah. And what ended up happening was towards the end of that, there was a deal breaker on the table for me. And that was when I wanted to have kids by. Mm. Yeah, I was going to ask you that. Yeah, I was like very clear about that at the very beginning of our relationship. And she had agreed to that at the beginning of our relationship. And then about three years into that relationship, she changed it. She was like, hey, you know, that seems a little soon for me. Can we do like, you know, I can't remember. It was like another year. Mm. And I was like, okay, I felt into it. And I'm like, I can negotiate that. Yeah. But then she went to change it again. Mm. And I was like, no. Because in hindsight, I can see that when people change a deal breaker, they're often trying to get the other person to stand in their deal breaker and leave. Mm -hmm. And just to wrap up relationship 1.0 is we recognize that actually, if this relationship required Kylie to believe she was a problem, like she had a problem in order to exist in it, then it wasn't the relationship I wanted to create. It wasn't the one she wanted to create. So I said true. to her, like, if you need to think you're broken to be in a relationship, maybe the information of the burning house yeah. is actually brilliant. Yeah. Maybe it's actually saying, instead of like going to all these people and going to a, like a Jungian therapist and figuring out like dream meaning, why don't we just take the dream at its wise value yeah. instead of it being a, this like deep metaphor of something else? You know, maybe actually we should trust it and that you're not broken, but you're brilliant. Yeah. Interesting. And maybe there's something that you're feeling that I don't. Mm. And now I can easily label that what she was feeling was the trepidation to create a relationship that required two people to self-abandon. Because it looks like she's self-abandoning in order to stay too. But I am as well, because no one in their right mind, if we were just looking at a checklist, if we were like, should you build a relationship with someone who is feeling like they might have to leave any day? Yeah, right. if you want a life of hell, yeah. if you want to be anxious for the rest of your life, then you'll go to the doctor and wonder why you're anxious. But it's pretty obvious why you're anxious, because you're not finding your voice. You're not in choice. You're putting your body in relational circumstances that are not actually healthy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I have so many questions. Mm, so <laughs> yeah, many. so go, many questions. Go. I guess like the one that stands out, it's like two years in, you're starting to feel this. Like, what was it that made you feel like it? You were saying, like, all intents and purposes, the relationship is running smoothly and appears healthy. And she moved to Vancouver. Yeah, like, and it yeah. seems like she's telling you, like, she wants to have kids and move it. But there's clearly something in your gut that's telling you this isn't right. Can you pinpoint that now in retrospect? No, I could just pinpoint the distance. Like, mm. I could feel somatically mm. in my body that there was a subtle, that she wasn't all in that I was like ready to choose this fully. You know, that's what's so interesting is what I learned through the process. And I think this is so true for if anyone resonates with more my side of the story, which women yeah. tend to resonate more with my side yeah. of the story, is that there actually is a bypassing of choice. Like there's a bypassing of being mindful about who you're choosing to create a relationship with. And that's what I really learned is like, I had blown by all of my own somatic senses yes. that I shouldn't continue to invest. But what I do know that's relational is that if you feel that and you bring it forward, there is possible healing and reorientation. Like maybe the person has complex trauma, you know, maybe they have stuff that they just don't realize that makes them want to distance. And there's an opportunity to work through that. Yeah. 
but it doesn't get worked through unless you bring it forward. And I think the real work for people who might identify more with my story is that you have to bring it forward. Yes. The truth has to be laid at the altar of the relationship. So were you having those conversations in Relationship 1.0? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we were. Really like we would find some sort of maybe peace or like a sense of we were building something and then it would show its place again. If I'm being really honest, it was there the whole time, but subtle, like Mm -hmm. there was just a knowing in my body, like I know deep in my unconscious, but it would come to my conscious mind was like, how do you build something with someone who had a dream that they might leave at any moment? And when we were working with the psychotherapist, I remember having this conversation with him and, and her And I just had this deep realization and this grief because in the awareness where it like really was confronted, I remember thinking like I had so much sadness and I was like, I learned somewhere that this is normal. Like I learned that someone not fully showing up for me is normal. And that's just my template. And it was just like such a beautifully sad moment of of recognition, you know, that, that the context of it is important. My heart's going, it's like screaming, yes, yes, yes. I Mm. feel that so much. And in my last relationship, there was a point where John Mayer's song, Slow Dancing in a Burning Room, kept playing (laughs) over and over again in my head. And I thought, that's exactly what we're doing. We are in love, but in a burning room. Like this is all going down at some point. And your description of your partner being turned away from you and you keep turning towards them is so real because I thought a good relationship is if you have that kind of disconnect, you're the one helping your partner turn, like put your hands on their shoulders and help them turn towards you or bring someone else in to help them turn towards you. And you're right. You're missing the your own choice of turning away and saying, this is not the relationship I want to be in. And, you know, this last partner I had, he kept saying, like, why do I feel like I'm the only one with problems in this relationship? Mm. Why am I the one getting all this help? What is wrong with me? And you're right. Like, if you feel like you're the one with the problems in the relationship, that's probably not a healthy relationship to be in. So thank you for validating all that. No, of course. And I resonate. I mean, that I got shivers. The challenge with relational teachings in general, on social media, or just in general, is that we don't identify that actually the person who needs to fix shit actually has to hold the identity that they're broken in order to keep facilitating the person who needs to help all the time. So like in order for them to stop being broken, the person trying to fix them has to stop giving them shit to do. Mm. Instead, we're like, here's what I need. Here's what adulting is. Go book the fucking therapy appointment yourself. Like if you don't, but I'm not doing it anymore. And so it's like, we think I'm inviting them to be an adult, but it's actually the adulting for ourselves is to stop because both are child behaviors. One, the person just is like, I'm a fuck up. Like nothing I do is enough. If you think about it, it's almost like learned helplessness. Mm -hmm. And the other person is their adaptive strategy is I'll never be enough. So I like have to be the fixer and the care for. And Mm -hmm. when you're done with that pattern, there's an exhale, but there's also a lack of trust because what we're really saying is I'm actually ready to relate to you and you relate to me as two healthy adults or two people building that. There's a lot of people who don't know how to relate to each other from healthy places. They actually need a problem. And I'm sure we can all or have been that. So I guess the question, and this is clearly you led to a breakup, but like, when do you realize that this just isn't the right person for you versus you need to both own your shit and work through it? Yeah, you know, in the book, we really wanted the reason we wrote the book was because we didn't have a path for ourselves, mm-hmm. you know, and, and we really were like, well, whether you're single or dating or in a long 25, 30 year marriage, every part of the book applies because what it does is give you context to like why you do it. And that's so important, the context, because the context depersonalizes it. Yeah. Because if you go like, oh, well, I identified it as a problem and it was because, let's say, my mom always criticized me and that's she always led with criticism, et cetera, et cetera. I now have some understanding that that was the adaptive strategy I needed in order to get to where I am, which is here, and now I can make changes. And so there's that aspect of being able to contextualize it and then actually get into creation mode. What do I want? 
and taking a pause from relational patterns. Like one of the things we do and we suggest in the book, we call it a sacred pause, but especially for people who are dating. And it's funny because I'll say to someone like, just take three months, no engaging with, if you're, you know, if you're heterosexual, no engaging with the opposite sex for three months, whatever your gender preference is. No texting, no sexting, no trying to draw their gaze. And you will see it as a drug. Mm. And what's funny is people will be like, well, I've already done that. I've been single four years. I'm like, you haven't done it. Trust <laughs> no, me. no. Uh -uh. Yeah. Yeah, it's very different, an intentional sacred pause than, you know, a dating and relating and swiping. But getting back to your original question is like, how do I begin to know? Well, the first part is, is that whenever I'm working with a couple, it's always like, let's actually just put staying together or breaking up off the table for a second. Mm. Because if your only intention is to stay together, then you might be actually missing valuable information. If one person doesn't want to be in that creation mode, it's already a game over. Mm -hmm. A lot of times couples go to therapy and one person doesn't want to be there and doesn't want to change. Yeah, right. So my space in that, and we invite this in the book too, is what is actually the radical truth that exists in you right now? Because even if you're afraid to say, well, I'm afraid that the relationship won't work. Great. Let's bring that truth into this space. Okay, I'm afraid that they'll cheat. Okay, let's bring that truth into the space. All of these truths exist anyways. And what ends up forming through the sacred pause, through the contextualization, is what we call in the book, like the great thaw. It's like actually thawing out your nervous system and getting back into your body. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, if, if we're the ones who are like staying turned towards all the time, it's more complex than this, but on some level, we're in a functional freeze because I'm frozen. Like, there's no way if someone said, I'm not sure I want to choose you, that I should be like, oh my God, I love you so much. <laughs> right, right. Like, right. I'm going to send you flowers. Right. I'm going to over pursue <laughs> you now. Right. Like, we would never say to a little kid who's, you know, got someone who says, I'm not really sure about you. We'd never say, oh my God, go convince them. Mm -hmm. We'd say, we love you so much. You do not have anything to do. And so the deeper sense that comes in is the ability to choose. Now, a lot of our relationships were built on previous agreements, previous selves, right? And so really relationships over time are two people changing on some level side by side. I wouldn't say together, but like side by side. But a lot of relationships initially are actually require the abandonment of self, right? They require the like, I don't know what I need, what I want. My life's about what you need. The other person's like, I mean, I have to have, be broken to be in this relationship. So, you know, I'll, I'll create needs for you. Mm -hmm. And so there's that differentiation is so important. And so I think I'm always like, there's a few questions I always ask people when they're like, should I stay or go? It's such a complex question. Yeah, it is. And it requires so <laughs> much nuance. But what I will say is the first question I ask is, is staying or going, leaving yourself? Mm -hmm. Because whatever your normal pattern is, things get hard. Right. And again, this is outside of the context of abuse. This is outside of the context in a relationship with a narcissist or a sociopath. Get out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But because often in those circumstances, we're like, if only I worked harder. It's like, if you're working harder, it's the thing you normally do. Maybe stop. Yeah. And the other question I think is just powerful is even if your partner changed everything and did everything you want, would you want to be with them? Mm. Asking someone, do you actually respect your partner? Mm. Yeah. Do you like them as a person? As a friend. Right. Even. Like, do you actually like their values? Do they disgust you? Like, why would you want to work out a relationship with someone who disgusts you? So coming back just like to yourself will lead to all of it anyways. Like, should I stay or go? We'll be like, who am I? What do I want with my life? And what am I committed to? Is that possible in this relationship? Yes or no. So what made you two decide it was time to let it go the first time around? There was that part of like, maybe there's brilliance and we've done everything else that we thought we could do. There's no more tools. Mm. Maybe actually this is the most loving thing we can do. And that led to us doing a closing ceremony, mm -hmm. which, oh. yeah, which was, our, we hadn't seen each other at the end of our relationship because I was traveling for work and we had been in the discussions and then we had a FaceTime call kind of as the final call. And Kylie had said to me, why would you want to stay? I remember she said, this, why would you want to stay with me? Like, I'm unsure. I'm da, da, da. And I'm like, no, no, no. Like, you don't get the easy way out. Like, you have to choose it to go hmm. because you have never done that. And so we had this final call where I was like, you need to say the words because I recognized that that actually it was in her choosing to leave, which I could honor. I didn't, right. you know, I remember saying to her, like, 
I had left an engagement when I was 27 and I would have been desperate to hear, you know, what I had said to her was, I love you. I want to create a life with you. But if you, for whatever reason, can't do that with me, I love you and you can go. And I wished that there, I had had the same level of sort of like, it was through the experience of my previous engagement that I had the tools and the language to say that. Because it was true. I just wish someone could witness the deep need that I had to go. I didn't know why, but I just had to. Mm -hmm. And so I could see that in her, this like, she was getting sick. She was like trying to figure this out. And I was like, you don't know, like there's nothing more to figure out. And in that conversation, you know, there was a lot of tears and she said like, okay, this relationship has to end. We, we spoke about a week later and I was like, Hey, do you think we should do a closing ceremony? And she was like, yeah, sure. Like we didn't know what that was, but I Googled it and <laughs> other people had done something. <laughs> yeah. I did one before. I was like, are there other yeah. crazy people? You <laughs> yep, did? Yep. Yeah. See, well done. I, uh, <laughs> we didn't get back together though. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think what is beautiful about the closing ceremony. So we answered three questions. What did we most appreciate about the other person and why? Mm. We lit a fire. Actually, getting back to the dream, we had bought a wooden birdhouse that represented the house and we burned it wow. during wow. the ceremony. Yeah. <laughs> I get emotional all the time thinking about the closing ceremony because I remember sitting outside in my car being like, I don't want to go in yeah. to the house. Mm -hmm. And I was like, do I not want to go because... I just genuinely don't want to do this right now. Or do I not want to go because the person who can do a closing ceremony doesn't exist yet? Mm -hmm. And it was the second answer. And so as I like, I have a commitment to always do the things I'm afraid of that I know I need to do. So I went in. Anyway, so we lit the fire, put some music on that we cared about that was important to us, answered that question. The second question was, what was our favorite memory? Mm -hmm. Oh God, that was mm -hmm. the hardest. And then the last question was, what do we hope for the other person? It was... Profound because we got to experience what is what is it like to let love go with grace yeah, yeah. And, and reverence. That love didn't go anywhere. It actually deepened on so many levels. And everything we'd been taught about society and culture about breakups was like hate each other. Yeah. Like, you know, yeah. all the things. Those are yeah. the hardest ones, though, sometimes. Well, because it's easier to get over someone that you yeah. hate. Totally. Yeah, it's a lot harder to get over someone you really love them. Yeah. That was it. It was like this strange paradox where I was yeah. like, I love this person so much. And here we are ending. And you guys live together at the time? We did. Yeah, we lived together. Okay. So you guys were like fully going through all the motions with it, but just it fell off. That was what I'm getting from you. There's something. Yeah, we were trying to figure out this like felt like 5%, but really it was 95. But it was like, we were really trying to figure out, like we were committed to each other. Yeah. We really love each mm -hmm. other. And so it was like, it was a hard thing because here you are, you're like, we have the tools, we have the teachers, yeah. and yet we can't figure this out. There's got to be a way. Mm -hmm. And then I learned a long time ago when I had left my engagement, although obviously didn't, I should have tattooed it. It was like, I just knew that when you're looking for an answer for years, for time, it's usually the answer you don't want to see. So you're mm -hmm. trying to find an answer that's anything but what you know. But how brave is that, that both of you can choose to let go of this relationship? I think very few people can do that in a relationship. I would say my ex cheated on me because he didn't want to make that choice. He wanted to force me into that choice. And you hear this a lot in relationships, too. It's like, yes. I want to drive this person away yeah. so they can break up. They can make that choice for us. So, I mean, that's really profound what you just described and just really brave. And once you two do decide to have this closing ceremony, what was your intention during that time? Because obviously you don't stop loving this person. I mean, by the time our relationship was done, <laughs> Kylie and I are quite different. But by the time it was done, I was done. Mm -hmm. Like I had uh, no interest in staying in the pattern. Yeah. I was so done with that pattern of like someone doesn't choose me. Yeah. It had to get to the place where it was. So I immediately was like, look, I love you. I'm going to mute you on every channel. Huh. Uh -huh. We have amazing mutual friends and we had discussed with them like, OK, if there's a celebration, please just invite whoever can go, but just let me know because I'm not ready mm -hmm. to be in the same space. And neither was she. And that was great. Like our friends, you know, were distraught by our own relationship ending, you know, and it was so beautiful because they didn't choose sides, you know, because there was no side. 
That was what was different. Right. So yeah, we went right away to no contact for three months. And we had one friend, a mutual, really good friend to both of us who would kind of mediate some messages that needed to be shared, like logistical things or like, because at the same time, you know, it was December 2019. It started in September of 2019. And so, you know, then we spoke again in December. We came back together, had a conversation, connected, and we were like, no. It's not aligned. Okay. And then we spoke for about a month. And then I realized I was on this retreat. And on this retreat, I remember I was I was a attendee. And I remember thinking to myself, like, I'm still in conversation with her. And she's still dictating the level of intimacy mm. and connection. Mm. And I was like, nope. So I went home, FaceTimed her. And I was like, I recognize that this is still happening. You're still deciding. I'm not. I'm deciding. I can't keep in contact with you. What was like wow. an example of that? Like, what was something that you felt that you're like, I feel like she's dictating the intimacy? Well, because I had been the one who always wanted more. Mm -hmm. And I was always the one who was like, I want more. But the capacity of, of the relationship was dictated by her capacity. Mm -hmm. And I realized I kept being the one who was consenting to someone else deciding the capacity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I was like, no. I'm deciding. I don't want to live in a space of longing. Yeah. Yeah. And so when I had that conversation with her, I mean, she's incredible. So she was like, oh, you're right. I am doing that. Mm. Yeah, that's not fair. And so we went back to no contact. And then, you know, COVID starts. And yeah. so here I am, like, thinking the world's ending. And I'm like, well, that's the person I'd want to come over. But you have to have such a deep reverence for the desire to fracture a boundary for whatever reason. Right. Yeah. And I just knew this is not a negotiation. Like my growth is not negotiable. My transformation is not negotiable. I never for once feared that I wouldn't find someone yeah. mm -hmm. because I knew that all you needed was two people who really cared about growth, yeah. yes. who really were curious, who had humility. Would you say you wanted like more from her? Like is was that marriage and kids or was it like more emotional capacity or both? You know, it, it'll show up as the symptom of I want more from her which the telling of that would make me the victim of her lack of capacity. Mm. But if I was really like, and this is the language that we get to in the book, if I'm really taking responsibility is I wanted more from myself mm. that needed to show up with boundaries and standards from the like what the relationship was capable of doing in alignment. I needed that because without that, she couldn't anyways. How did you get there? Like, how were you able to flip that? Because I think that's <laughs> such a pivotal point of this conversation, right? Because we always hear people yeah. just being like, I wanted more. They couldn't give it to me. Right. How right. do you take that accountability? If you want to move to the next level in your life, it's not optional. Because the challenge or the sort of strange juxtaposition of being a victim, but not living in a victim mindset, because that's usually what happens is we'll say, like someone might hear initially without some context what I'm saying and they would go, oh, that's victim blaming, right. you know, and but really what I'm saying is you can be the victim of an experience, mm -hmm. right? But it is your responsibility with what you do with the experience. Yeah. And we live in this binary world. You're either this or you're that. You're either that. Da, 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 da. And this is not binary. This actually is the complexity because someone can have been through ultimate trauma and that experience can have fueled creating the most beautiful thing in the world. And so we're not saying, well, no, because no trauma, no beauty. And that's not giving permission or anything. And that's usually the sort of, so to like actually make the leap to the full sense of responsibility, because I guarantee there's someone else on a podcast saying, yeah, they couldn't fucking show up. Move on to the next. Right, right. right. I'm sure yeah. you've seen yeah. uh, that viral thing where it says, find a man who will. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It's easy to say that. Right. And then you flip it around and you say, find a woman who will, and it doesn't sound quite <laughs> as nice, does it? But it's necessary because without me taking responsibility for my role, I don't allow them the freedom to take responsibility for their identity of brokenness. I mean, I see what you're saying, but I also see the other side. Like, what's the line? Because we wouldn't want someone that's like in this situation ship where the person is not giving them anything to be like, well, I just need to take accountability. A hundred percent. How do you know you should. what's that line? You think you should. Okay. If you're in a situation ship and you want more and they don't, then you are consenting to be in a relationship dynamic with someone where you're actually misrepresenting possibly and not honoring what you truly desire. You're accepting breadcrumbs. You're accepting something okay. less. And then you're the victim of the situationship, but you're not. 
you are choosing to be with someone who can't show up fully for you, likely because there's a familiar wound. And now you get to say, oh, they just treat me like a girlfriend, but right. they're not. They're not ready for commitment. Neither are you. I, I see what you're saying. You're not saying like take accountability, like try to make it work with them. It's take accountability and like own how you're showing up to this. Yeah. Like write on a piece of paper what's true. Like we have a chapter in the book that's called Getting Right with Reality and Breaking Up with Normal. Yeah. Those chapters are like savage takedowns of perception <laughs> of of like fantasy land, you know, because a lot of people who stay in those types of circumstances learn somewhere they couldn't have what they desired. Yeah. But what happens is we live in the wound of rejection because we stay in circumstances that are rejecting. But I get to blame the guy or the girl when it's really me who's rejecting my desires. So I am the birthplace of the thing that I'm projecting onto them. It's like, this is a really tough one to hold. But I, at this point, I'm going to say 100% of the time, which I normally would qualify something with like 99.9. <laughs> <laughs> I'm bracing you're myself. Bold, I'm gonna, I like it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> 100% of the time, external betrayals are preceded by internal betrayals. Mm. So infidelities, lying, cheating of someone else, usually, usually, always, is preceded by some sort of betrayal of ourselves. Mm. Hmm. And that doesn't mean it's anyone's fault because that's where we go to, oh, so you're victim blaming the people who've been cheated on. No. What I'm saying is we probably learn somewhere to bypass and betray ourselves mm. to maintain connection. Mm. So we're not villainizing sure. it. We're just calling out the truth of it. I, I had a friend who was telling me this story about a relational circumstance. Da, 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 and I'm like, OK, we just need to actually connect to the part. What did you choose? Right. Yes. right. And as soon as she was able to own that, this guy cheated with multiple women, secret life, blah, blah, blah. Now you're dealing with, that's a pretty crazy behavior. That's very like, you're getting into like narcissistic, sociopathic behavior. But I was like, where was the earliest sign that you missed a red flag? Yeah. Yeah. And she was like, it was here. And I'm like, is there anywhere earlier? Because till you can get to the first moment, that's where you left yourself. Yeah. And then the three-year relationship is just created on the abandonment. You are what you tolerate. Right? All of that, all the behavior in your life is what you've tolerated in your life. Amen. So we got to take accountability for that as well. And I think about the infidelity that you're talking about, Mark. I think about this all the time. It is because I had let go of my needs that gave him permission to forego, yeah. to disrespect. Because it's like, it's the whole roller coaster of one day taking me out ring shopping and the next day being like, I'm not sure this is for me. That's the worst. I never chose that, right? I never right. sat there and said, oh, would I choose this for myself? I just sat there and waited and, and said, why is he changing his mind? Yeah. Everything was on him, but I never turned it back on me and said, am I just abandoning myself by allowing him to make all these choices for us? So, Mark, what was your moment then in this relationship that you were like, I'm abandoning myself? And then how did you take that accountability? And then that eventually moved to a new relationship with Kylie. It was that moment of of the recognition, like I learned somewhere to tolerate being in a relationship with someone who doesn't fully choose me. And it was also in recognizing that like somehow I was getting importance and value by trying to help her. So I was like sourcing safety and security mm -hmm. by trying to fix things. So when I recognized that, I realized how unhealthy and unfair that was and the impact that was having on her. And I remember when I said to her, like, what happens if we just see what you're feeling as being signs of your brilliance, not your brokenness? And I remember her just crying because it was like the first time her feeling had been validated. Mm. And instead of us trying to be like, what's next to fix the feeling you have? It was like, uh, let's actually ask it questions. Mm. Let's get curious. Mm. So for me, it was when I had the awareness, it was like, no more. Like when I finally connected to the anger too, like yeah, a healthy yeah. level of, why am I in a relationship with someone who's telling me about dreams about leaving? Or like, <laughs> why do we tolerate these? Like, fuck this. Yeah. And so when I took that stand, and also had empathy for her need, then she started to trust me wow. on a deeper level, right? Because she's like, he's calling out the truth of our connection and he's, he's actually standing in his non-negotiables. Yes. Ah, now I can trust him. I want to dive into this even more, but before we do, let's take a quick break to hear from our partners. 
Ah, uh, spring, a time for new beginnings. But you know what adds an extra spring to my step? Our partners at Via Hemp. Whether you want to get better sleep, ease anxiety, enhance your mood, or just get high, they have something for you, including their best selling high love gummy, which will awaken your senses, increase blood flow, and intensify any sexual experience. A couple of weeks ago, I shared some of my gummies with my cleaner, Lou, who we've also had as a guest on this podcast. Shout out to Lou. The first thing he said to me when he came over today was if he could have more because they were that damn good. Personally, I've been liking their zero THC products. So whether you're a two milligram or a 50 milligram user, Via has something for you. So head to viahemp.com and use the code DATABLE to receive 15% off in one free sample of their award-winning gummies, 21 plus. That's V-I-I-A hemp.com and use the code DATABLE at checkout. Please support our show and tell them we sent you. Take your passion and pleasure to a whole new level with high love from Via Hemp. Okay, this is the part that I'm hearing our listeners ask, like, why try it again with her versus find someone else that, you know, can meet that need and you don't worry that they choose you. Well, you know, I went back into my relationship history and I realized I ran from every woman who could actually show up and love me. Mm. And, you know, we all would have brought our own can of worms, you know, because that's that's how it works. But that's what we do. Yeah. But like I recognized that like a woman I was terrified of and I needed to heal and fix these things like like change and, and get access to my voice and stop sourcing from trying to help and save people. Because it changed my work too. It changed so many things. Because, you know, if, if you're monetizing your survival strategy, then there's still a part of you that needs your client to need you. Mm -hmm. And that means you're not freeing them. Mm. And so I started to see this. And I, you know, now I've like, I just did a workshop with coaches and nutritionists and dietitians and therapists talking about this, this like deeper thing that needs to be healed where we're hooking into the people we're working yes. with. And so it's not freeing them to actually heal. Right. Because we're living out the same dynamic and we don't think we are because they're paying us money. Right. So repeating the same patterns. Exactly. And just calling it a job. <laughs> mm -hmm. And when I started to really step into that and I had the awareness of that, I was actually totally open to Kylie being the person potentially, okay. but she would be the one who had to come to me. Mm. I had no interest in going to her and she knew that, you know, and she was doing her own personal work during that time. And she was thinking like, I don't want to repeat this. Yeah. Like I need to figure out what is going on and like get deeper into this, which she talks about in the book. And on some level, like, so I could turn towards a relationship potentially with Mark, but a relationship in general. Right. And so she messaged me one day and was like, hey, I'd love to have a conversation with you and catch up. And so she came over. Mm -hmm. How long was this after the breakup? Eight months, seven months. Okay. So a lot of, enough okay. time has gone by or a lot of time. Yeah. This is by. about three months after I said, I'm no longer going to let you dictate the okay. capacity, mm -hmm. like the level of, and so she she said to me, I've learned a lot. Here's the things I've learned. I'm ready to choose this relationship. And I'm, I'm curious about exploring it with you. And so I was like, okay. And I could tell she was different. There was like mm -hmm. a different energy to her. She had that woman swagger. Now <laughs> there was like certainty in her choice. Like I could feel it. I was terrified of it, but I could feel it. And I remember, so we created what we called a dating container. Okay. And so we created like structure around it, which it would be three months, but by the end of the three months and throughout, we would check in, mm -hmm. is this connection working? Mm. Is this actually the right way our relationship should be structured? And it was actually through that, which is really interesting. I started to see how I wanted to accelerate the relationship, like, oh, we're back together. Yeah, that's the like go-to normally, uh -huh. right? Yeah, yeah. And she'd be like, well, we're like exploring that like slow down and i was like oh yeah oh yeah i'm not <laughs> ready to choose this right. like this isn't huh. still is not a yes for me mm. but i'm bypassing again my no or my maybe huh. and so she was so grounded at that time it was like a little intimidating she was like yoda like a hot yoda <laughs> <And> she, <laughs> she she said to me it was actually really beautiful because i said to her how do i even trust you yeah like you told me that you chose this we spent four years in this dance how do I trust you now? Like you're saying it now, meh. And she was like, you're right. 
I'm not going anywhere and I choose you. Mm. Wow. And I get that you don't trust it yet. And I was like, <laughs> you know, because it was like everything I needed to hear, yeah. but there was like an embodiment to her certainty. Mm. But there was also a reality, yeah. which that's the thing we really learned. If we could be fiercely dedicated to the reality that this might not work. There was actually freedom in that. That actually creates some, a tremendous amount of fear and trepidation for people. For sure. But that's yeah. actually freedom because we're saying all of this is true anyways. Right. And yeah. so by bringing it, it becomes material that the relationship works with. Like I remember saying to her once in the container, like, this isn't feeling good for me. Mm. Here's what's coming up. And she was like, yeah, thank you for bringing that forward. And then we talked mm. about it. And then there's more trust. I guess like as a listener, I'm still like, what is that difference? What I'm hearing from you is there was a feeling just in the way she yeah. asserted herself and the tone and all that. But like, what were the other major changes? The major change was that neither of us were in our adaptive strategies anymore. Neither of us were in our codependent patterns. They were subtle, like we had to continue to call out where they were showing up. But no longer did I need her to be broken. She was a fully functioning, amazing adult. Mm. And no longer did I need to try to fix because I didn't need someone to choose me anymore. I'd chosen myself. Uh, I took it off the table. I see. So when we orient to our relationship from our wounds, that's very normal. That's what we do till we don't. What happens when, so, you know, we sort of spend our lives choosing people who wound us in a familiar way to a parent who wounded us the most. That's sort of how it works. It is through the thing you want most from somebody in your dating process is actually the thing you must give to yourself. And once you give it to yourself, then you no longer seek it unconsciously from the other mm. and then you can love each other. Yeah, I think it's important for anybody listening right now to just pause and rewind and listen to the dating container again, because I think that is how dating should be done. We should be dating in a dating container before we even take that next step, because I think we go from like dating to committing to a relationship, which means committing to let's making this last. But we don't commit to, we're not committing to, I want to express my yeah. needs. We're not committing to, I want to honor your needs. Those are not the commitments we make when we define the relationship. That's a huge step that we're skipping. I think the other big piece, too, is the fact that like you didn't rush right back into it because I've been there before where I've broken up with someone, got back together and nothing changes each time because it's right. you're just repeating the same patterns. I really yeah. believe like if you're going to give a 2.0 a try and really make it work, like the fundamentals need to change. You can't just go right back to where it was. No, that's why the language like, how do I get back together with my ex? I'm always such a stickler. It's like, don't <laughs> move forward. Yeah. Like be yeah. walking forward in your life and they'll meet you walking forward. And whoever meets you walking forward, you won't care if it's them. That's such a good yeah. distinction. Love yeah. that. It makes such a difference. I remember hearing Alan Watts say, why fall in love? Rise. And it's such a difference, you know, like rise in love. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like in the book, mm -hmm. we talk like our principles of liberated love. One is a fierce dedication to the truth. Another one is honoring each other's path as their own, that we're honoring the sovereignty and choice of the other. And it is actually through doing that, that the relationship becomes a place of expanding ourselves instead of collapsing ourselves. Who wouldn't want to be in a relationship where one of the major intentions is to bring each individual alive more, more mm -hmm. healed, more powerful. Like my wife getting more access to her voice doesn't threaten me right. because it just makes her more powerful, which is great. It's only when power dynamics are what I'm playing with that that is scary yeah. or or I don't want it. I really like how you were able to share from like the anxious perspective. I mean, if we're going to use anxious avoidant terms, but yeah. you know, the person that feels like they're not getting enough in the relationship. I think a lot of people, a lot of our listeners can probably relate to that. And it is so easy to blame the other person. So easy. But this, yeah, like this taking accountability and, you know, doing it for yourself. Like how else were you both, I guess, able to heal within the relationship? Because I think that's another misnomer is we think we need to get it all together before we meet that person. Yeah, you know, it was through starting to say, hey, we're going to use this relationship to heal. Mm. And so I always think there's the logistical competency part of relationship, right? Like the skill set, the words, the language, the energetics. The other thing is that we healed our nervous systems. Mm. You know, like we talk in the book about how the nervous system is actually layered in all of this. Because a lot of conversations about relational patterns like anxious or avoidance or attachment, codependency, they don't actually bring into context that you are a mammal who has a nervous system. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these behaviors are actually encoded in your nervous system. So 
what's going on when you get super anxious when someone doesn't message you back is really an automated process right. that's a memory within the nervous system. So we're saying like, hey, let's actually use this to heal that. So some of the other ways were through that, just like the awareness, right? Like the awareness of all these things that are going on, awareness of each other's wounds, each other's mm -hmm. ways that we get when we're stressed and taking accountability, a massive amount of just like accountability and humility. Yeah. And, you know, one of the principles we have in the book is a mutual sense of positive regard for one another, mm -hmm. yes. just a deep sense of respect. So how did you decide like, okay, we're, we're doing this again? Like, how did you get out of the relationship container and like eventually get married and have a baby? Like, what was that process? So we were both very excited and we were excited about what was possible. We survived the three months. Trust was being rebuilt. And there was just alignment. And, and, you know, mind you, through all this, all the things are going on in the world. And so there's a deep level of trust as we're navigating that together. Mm -hmm. And, you know, once we knew that the previous things from the previous relationship were this material that created a different relationship, now there was just deep trust and it was like full steam ahead. Mm -hmm. And obviously we don't have Kylie here. We'll have to get her for another episode. But like, what was the key work you think she did? Like what changed within her without having to like feel like she's broken and oh. needs to change? Well, the closing ceremony and the way it ended was sort of the catalyst to that because now she was like, okay, I need to get to the root of this. And she talks about it in the book. She did this session with one of our mentors. His name's Mark Walla. And he's one of the most world-renowned experts in inherited trauma. Mm. And he did a session with her. I was saying to Kai, like, oh, you should do, we had broken up, right? So, and I was like, you should do a session with Mark Walla. And she's like, eh. I don't really need it. And she gets on with him and he says to her um, something along the lines of, I'm paraphrasing, but he says, till you heal your family stuff, essentially, mm. man will always be mother. Mm. And if you don't do the work, I'll be having this conversation again with you in two years. Damn. And that really dove her into, I'm not sure if you guys have learned about like the mother wound, which is of course not just mother. It's like the mother as like a, a sort of archetype too. The mother wound, I don't know all the like intricate details of it, but let's say, for example, it's like it, the unconscious desire for the mother to protect the daughter from being, you know, too powerful because they gave away their own power, but they fear that a powerful woman will be, you know, is not safe in this world, that the mother doesn't allow the daughter to outshine or become more, et cetera. Oh, now, I'm not speaking to her specific dynamic. They, yeah, there's experts on the mother wound that are worth having on because it's such a, yeah. I'm definitely not doing it justice, but I'll, that's just sort of like a framework of it. And it's mm -hmm. much more complex and more beautifully said by Kai and, and an expert in it. But what's interesting is when she healed that, she actually did what was called a no man diet, which was <laughs> guided by a woman who does it still. She runs groups on it, Kendra Kunov. Okay. And in that, she entered a three-month container, no contact, no anything, and no communication with any men, no anything. And she said that she felt like she was dying. Whoa. Like she felt like... Who was she without the male gaze? Mm. Who was she without male attention? Who was she? She saw all the ways she sourced and manipulated wow. and, and, and tried to become valuable and important and attractive. And, but yeah, at the end of the day, what was really like, if I think about what is at the core of this, and this is a hard, I think a hard truth for our culture to be with is that ultimately everything comes down to our early childhood and our mother's ability to be attuned to us. Now, granted, there are a lot of societal, environmental, all these factors that get in the way of that. And those are all valid. But at the end of the day, what it just says to me is like, how do we create families, friends, groups that allow the support of the mother to be well resourced mm -hmm. so she can be attuned to the child. Because what I'm even saying is like, it's hard when a single mom, a mom working a job, right? Like there's so much, that's why I don't. Yeah. What quickly happens is then a woman feels guilty yeah. that she couldn't show up fully or life. So this is not to cause that, but I'm also not wanting to protect anyone from that mm -hmm. because it's actually an important truth. I remember talking to my mentor and he said, I was like, so like a caregiver. And he's like, caregiver is a word we use when we want to reduce the amount of pain knowing that the mother wasn't the one. Mm. Oh, wow. And I was like, oh, wow, that's true. Like when I felt into that, I was like, that's actually true. We don't 
But he's like, if you actually just see that you're replacing mother with caregiver, you're actually protecting them from the experience of knowing their mother wasn't there. Right, right. And I was like, holy moly. So, you know, I look at all of it and it's like, well, where do you, fathers, of course, are important. But I remember asking him that, like, the father matters, right? He was like, yeah. Eh. <laughs> this is as I'm a dad, you know, and I'm like, I'm important. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. But, but what was really cool, yeah, as he said, the mother prepares the neural architecture of the child for the world and then hands the child to the father to take them into the world. Mm. Wow. That's beautiful. Yeah. And when I share that on social media, a lot of the response I got was like, but I take my kid on adventures, but my, and I'm like, I get it. There's so much complexity to the human yeah. experience. It's funny that if we don't hear our own experience expressed in a 30 second clip, <laughs> I know. We it's like, that's like, not me. Yeah. yeah. And it's like, okay. And I, I say all this because it's like the work relationally is actually about providing the thing you didn't get. Now, granted, of course, our wounds could be with our father, right? I'm not, it's not just a blank slate because a father abandoning, not being available, all those types of things can be the pursuit of unavailability as an adult. But yeah, it's really interesting because like when you think about it, what you're really doing when I finally said no more is I was attuning to myself. Yeah. So we are not destined to a life of poor relating because we had a parent who couldn't show up. Just like your attachment style is a style, it's not who you are. Right. It's just what you're prone to when there's insecurity yeah. or a lack of safety. Right. But can you actually start to attune to yourself, attend to your needs? And at the end of the day, what I think all relational friction is really inviting, and that means any, that could be with food, that could be with your body, that could be with your health on some level, it could be with your job, it could be with your purpose. It's all saying, can you honor who you are? And when, when you need to, do you have your own back? Mm. Yeah. So I want to bring this back to your book. In a nutshell, I feel like this is related. What is liberated love? Liberated love is the celebration and the creation of a space between you and other people because it's not just going to be romantic. Once you build the template, you're going to change every relationship in your life. You're going to change your life because what we're saying is you as a human matter and instead of looking at the frictions in your relationships as evidence of a problem that you have, mm -hmm. see them as evidence of the potential that you have. Mm -hmm. They're just giving you information. If you think about it from the process of alchemy, right. it's like you're turning what you see as bad stuff into fucking gold. Yeah. Like yeah. liberated love is about actually using love as a path to liberation yeah. on every level. And to me, it's like, well, once you do that, once you say to a partner, like, this is what I want to create. Do you want to create that with me? Like, imagine if your Tinder profile said, I want to use this container of relationship to bring both of us alive and achieve our dreams. Yeah. I'm yeah. like, swipe right all day. <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah. Even if you have a fish in a picture. Right. <laughs> That's a swipe right. Okay, that's that, even if that's it's an a actionable bathroom tip for mirror people. selfie. The, yeah. the fish, the fish represents liberated yeah. love. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. So putting it into example sake again too, like for you and Kylie, what was kind of that example of like how you turned maybe an issue or something that was broken with both of you into that liberated love like growth opportunity? It's now just a way of being. Okay, so. One of the other principles of liberated love is when something's coming up for one person, it's coming up for both. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's huge. It's just that the other person might not feel it yet. Mm. And so there's actually, instead of like, oh, that's your problem, it's like, oh, that's ours. Okay. Mm -hmm. Like you're feeling neglected. That's not my experience of what's happening, but tell me more about it. Mm. So in, in internet language, we'd be like, that's gaslighting. It's not. It's just saying like, Maybe that's not true for me, but I'm not saying it's not true for you. Right. Right. You know, because yeah. really, what is a relationship? It's two truths that can be subjective, that coexist, that through the conversation and dialogue, you create a deeper truth. Right. And that one includes the both of you. You're relating to each other. So if one person feels something, the yeah. other person. Yeah. So then yeah. you're not feeling... And then you don't hide it. Instead, the relationship is like, tell us, okay, like share the thing that's coming up for you because that's what leads to breakthroughs. Yeah. That's what leads yeah. to transformation. But there's a difference of codependency with that though, right? Yes. So if you're relating from a place of always having problems and that's how you create connection, that's very different. And that delineation, I think, is pretty felt. Like you could tell when that's happening. You could tell when someone only connects through criticism. One of the ways that 
people who have more of an anxious style of attachment, probably some fear of abandonment in there is they'll want to talk about everything all the time mm-hmm. because they don't yet know how to self-regulate and hold on to things a little longer before they engage. Mm-hmm. Oh, gosh, there's just so many nuggets in this that I need to rewind and listen for myself. Yeah. What advice, we're going to wrap this up very quickly here, but what advice would you give to someone who may be in a relationship like you and Kylie in relationship 1.0, where you're on a relationship escalator? I feel like this is this happens a lot. You're going through the yeah. motions, you're on this escalator, it's going up, but your connection or your feelings may be not catching up with the escalator. Yet, You've moved in, you've met parents, you've merged friend groups. For anybody going through that who's like, I'm so afraid to take myself out of this relationship because we're already on this escalator, what advice would you give to that person? Well, recognizing that the momentum of life is maybe having you leave your center, Mm. right? So you're allowing yourself to go up an escalator that you're actually not ready to go up. And so just being with that truth, like, oh, things are really moving. There's all these indicators, but yet, you know, in a way, This can be a a pretty regular pattern for people where they meet their needs with wants. Hmm. I need, and and sorry, I need you to to know I'm chosen. I want you to post me on social media. I need to know that we have a future. Let's have a kid. Hmm. But what's really not happening is we're not getting to the deeper sense of security. It's like the conversation Kylie and I were having about timing of children Hmm. was really a conversation about alignment, Hmm. you know? And so can we create the foundation of security before we create all the other things. Now, granted, you might be listening to this or watching this and you're like, shit, I created all the other things and now I want the security. We sometimes do it in the opposite order. And that's okay because that's actually what most people do is do it in the opposite Mm. order. They think the milestones actually prove what is only a felt sense. Wow. That's very profound. (laughs) I mean, I think my biggest takeaway with this whole conversation, again, probably to listen to this like three times to get it all. But I think the big one that's coming up for me is, you know, behind any unmet need that you have of others, there is something deeper within yourself. And we always talk about this too with dating. It is a mirror into what's happening for you. And, you know, relationships and all of that is a place to heal, but also to recognize what's bringing up for you. Because I think in relationships, you could really have a lot start to confront you. And, you know, the biggest thing with the should you get back with your ex, like I also hate the way that is phrased, but it's like, unless you're both willing to do something different and approach things in a way that actually getting to the root of what the challenge is that you're facing, that's how you know if you should pursue something again. And I loved what you said earlier, Mark, about it wasn't about getting back with my ex. It was moving forward. And if they met me there, then that was the right person or someone else could have been too. What a great synopsis. Yeah. I, you know, I'm always brought back. I don't know if I shared this in the book. I can't remember. But one of my favorite lines from Abraham Hicks. Do you know Abraham Hicks? Mm Mm-mm. Abraham Hicks, if you can let go of what I, the esoteric nature of what I'm about to say, the, the actual groundedness in the words are brilliant. Abraham Hicks is a woman named Esther who channels a guy named Abraham. Mm-hmm. If you listen to Abraham Hicks's stuff on YouTube, you'll be like, holy shit, this stuff is dialed. What's really interesting that she said that has always stuck with me is she said, or he, whenever you say that you desire something, the universe will orchestrate to bring everything into your path so that you can hold it. Mm. So if you say, I desire a great relationship, then everything that needs to be resolved for you to create that will be brought into your life. Mm. And so that's why I think if we can say, I'm so tired of picking this type of person, good, you should be tired. But what is actually the deeper level of responsibility you can take in this? Where's your role? You know, it's like that. I saw a funny meme the other day that said the dating pool has pee in it. (laughs) (laughs) I know. (laughs) So good. But it doesn't all, right? And there's so many stories of people's dating world that disprove our own beliefs about dating. And so for me, it's like, what beliefs are you holding and are they helpful? And what work do you need to do? Because that's it, man. That's the hardest stuff is like, If you keep attracting unavailable people, you are being invited to actually let go of unavailable people. And Mm. to be fair, till you have access to your no, your yes isn't real. Yeah. That's very much related to my two main takeaways. One is the creation stage of a relationship, especially a new relationship. 
many of us, in addition to falling in love, we fall into relationships. We kind of just ride it out, see where this takes us. But being intentional about creating what does a healthy relationship look like just for you and I, that's unique to us, is so important in that early stage. And then also the question of, is your identity in a relationship what's holding you back? Your thoughts about, you know, Kylie being the broken one. She thought mm -hmm. she was the one that needed help. She had all these issues. Well, I think we have a lot of these identities in our relationships. You know, you've heard the golden retriever and cat, you know, the identities where one person's always the one wanting attention and the other one's like the bitch, you know, like I'll give you attention That's when funny. I give it to you. <laughs> and then when you are that, when you assume that identity, you just, what do you do? You just keep feeding more into that identity. And in fact, your partner also enables you to become more of that identity. So I think it's a great, great pause for all of us to think, am I identifying myself in a certain way in this relationship that is holding me back? And so the, just having the mindfulness around how we build relationships is the ultimate takeaway. So thank you for letting us be on your journey of how you and Kylie rebuilt your relationship to a completely new one. You did not go back to your ex. <laughs> you started a new relationship yep. with a new person, both of you. Yeah. Yeah, it's been quite a journey, that's for sure. <laughs> and you can read all about it because there's a whole book about yeah. it. So. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> yeah, we share lots of client stories in the book too, Great. which I think is good for people. And the audio book is actually really special because I'm a big audio book yeah. guy. I don't actually remember the last time I read a hardcover book. I love book. audio books. And yeah. we had unscripted conversations at the end of each mm. chapter where we discuss the chapters. Love it. Okay, I'm going to download the audio book today then. Yes. It's so much fun. It was a lot of fun. And and I, you know, the audio book has been crushing compared to nice. the written book, which is interesting. Well, we are definitely going to link both in the show notes. Anything else you want to share with people before we wrap up? I mean, I think the thing I always want to remind people of is that you can create anything you want. Mm. Great love doesn't come to those who are lucky. Yeah. It comes to the people who take responsibility for creating it. That's such a good way to oh, end. I love that so much. But you know what? Great love does come to those who go to Apple Podcasts and give both of our shows um, a rating, a review. It Five does. star review and a written review. And make written sure you review. smash that subscribe button. Yes. It, we, it's been proven scientifically. Yeah, great love it improves does your well being. Love. Yep. It's actually true. It's true. Paying it forward. Okay. On that note, we're going to wrap up this episode. Stay Datable. The Datable Podcast is part of the Frolic Media Network. Find more podcasts you'll love at frolic.media slash podcasts. You can follow us on Instagram at Datable Podcast and visit datablepodcast.com for access to all the episodes and our premium programs. Also, make sure to subscribe today if you haven't already on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast platform so you are the first to get all the latest episodes. And most importantly, stay datable. Stay